Hi, everyone. Hello, friends and colleagues and new faces. Uh, welcome to the first ever World CRISPR Day uh, presented by Synthigo. So my name is Kevin Holden, and I'm head of science at Synthigo, and I'll be your host today uh, for this virtual event. We have uh, an incredible lineup of talented scientists uh, with us today from around the world who are excited to share with you how they've been utilizing uh, the CRISPR technology in a wide number of scientific applications uh, to advance human health, to benefit the world, uh, and also to understand biology uh, better. So in addition, uh, I just want to say we're also deeply excited uh, and honored to be joined by a visionary scientist today um, who was recently awarded a Nobel Prize for her role in the discovery of the CRISPR technology, Jennifer Dalda. Uh, most of all, though, we're all very grateful that you've chosen to join us today on this journey of scientific discovery. So thank you, um, all 10,000 of you who registered uh, to participate today. Um, that's truly an outstanding number, and I think it speaks both to the impact and the interest uh, in genome engineering technologies. So before we get started, um, I did want to go over some housekeeping items with everybody here. So uh, first of all, most sessions will be available on demand following the event. Uh, you can use the Q&A option to send questions to the host during the sessions. We have an expo hall, and also we have virtual booths that are open uh, starting at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and uh, for event support or help, uh, please visit the info desk for uh, FAQs. If you have additional questions, um, send a message in the lobby chat. And please feel free to share on social media today using the hashtag, hashtag World CRISPR Day. Okay, just to go over our schedule of events today. Um, first, we'll have an introduction uh, talk from Paul Dabrowski, CEO of Synthigo. Um, and that will be followed by our, our keynote address uh, from Jennifer Doudna, who is a recent Nobel laureate and also uh, a true pioneer of the CRISPR technology. Um, after the introduction and the keynotes, we'll go into the session schedule. Um, this is where we have concurrent sessions across three different blocks of time. Um, each session has three speakers with 20 minutes of talking per speaker. Uh, that's 50 minutes uh, talking and five minutes of Q&A. Uh, in the first session block, we'll be covering uh, CRISPR in cell and gene therapies, and also at the same time, CRISPR in disease research. Uh, for the second block, uh, CRISPR in animal models, um, CRISPR in genome biology, and also CRISPR in stem cells. Uh, and for the third block, um, CRISPR in agriculture, uh, CRISPR in functional genomics and drug discovery, and a, the biology of CRISPR applications. Um, that'll be followed um, a little bit later by a panel discussion uh, by some of the producers and also the stars of the CRISPR documentary film, Human Nature. Um, and that's we're calling that the future of CRISPR engineering and educational challenges. Um, and that'll be followed by a networking session uh, a little bit later um, in the afternoon. And so um, we have these networking sessions set up as like a lounge. Um, so you can actually go in either individually or, in, or you can also interact with people in groups. Um, these networking sessions correspond to um, the actual sessions that we have uh, during the day. So you can actually pick up the conversations and discussions that you were having earlier um, in, in a group setting. OK, also um, to help you reach um, you know, your CRISPR research goals. Um, we also have a fantastic group of companies and uh, nonprofits um, joining us today. Um, and they are in an expo hall, which opens at 10 a.m. Um, and so there's a number of vendors here, whether you would like to talk to um, Al Devron, who uh, have become the experts at supplying um, the nuclease that people use for CRISPR, Cas9. Uh, maybe you want to talk to uh, Cell Microsystems, who uh, have produce some, uh, develop uh, some amazing single cell um, uh, platforms for isolating uh, clonal cells, or maybe you'd like to talk to uh, the CRISPR journal um, and publish your work um, on CRISPR. So um, go over to one of those booths and um, you can meet representatives uh, from those companies. Um, actually, I believe that the, the CRISPR journal booth, uh, Kevin Davies is, is there and um, he's the editor in chief of CRISPR journal and uh, recently actually uh, came out with a, uh, a new book, Editing Humanity. I just got my copy, so I'm waiting to pick that up. So go check that out. 
Okay, and um, also I just want to let you know that um, Synthago has some booths uh, available um, to help all of your CRISPR resources as well. We have a main booth uh, where you can learn all about um, who we are and what we do. And we also have some booths um, that uh, address uh, particular applications that um, people are using for CRISPR, uh, some of which we're talking about today, like functional genomics and drug discovery or cell and gene therapy. Um, we engineer cell lines. We also have an, uh, a booth set up to share with you some um, uh, uh, CRISPR stories for scientists. So these are um, research stories from scientists that uh, we've worked with. Uh, it could be publications, it could be interviews and blogs. And of course, um, we also have a career center. So we're always looking for brilliant scientists and engineers uh, to work with us and other support staff. So if you're interested in uh, joining the genome engineering revolution, please come by our career booth. Um, I also just wanted to point out that um, uh, visitors today to the Synthago booth are eligible to get actually free guide RNA that they can use uh, for a CRISPR experiment or uh, to do a gene knockout. And we have exclusive pricing on all the products um, all day. So go ahead and, and please check out the, the booth for both Synthago and our other um, vendors and nonprofits. Okay, lastly, I just wanted to let you know that um, uh, what's really fantastic about today is if you stay engaged, you will get rewarded. So um, in order to really promote engagement with your fellow attendees and make it seem like we're actually at a real conference, we're offering a few fun prizes. And so you can win these prizes and we have up for grabs uh, an iPhone 12, uh, a new iPad or uh, some AirPod Pros. Um, you need to accumulate points and you can accumulate points throughout the day by visiting exhibitor booths, interacting with those booths or downloading information from those booths um, of our exhibitors um, and also through chatting with your other attendees. And you can track your progress by referring to the leaderboard uh, in the lobby. Um, I did just want to note though, in order to win any of these prizes, uh, the email address you registered with does need to belong to either an institution or a company. Okay, and uh, before we go uh, any further, I did want to say a big thank you to um, the Synthago team that helped to produce and put together World CRISPR Day. Um, and so here you can see some of the, the women and men that worked on this to make this thing a reality. Um, it took a lot of hard work and uh, especially uh, I wanted to call out the efforts of uh, Bobby Moon uh, on the top right there, um, who is our uh, Senior Director of Marketing and um, really uh, much of World CRISPR Day is the brainchild of Bobby Moon. So um, this is all happening because of him. So um, thank you everyone on the team and um, uh, we can uh, hopefully look forward to an exciting day, uh, World CRISPR Day. Okay, so um, before we get started uh, in, in our talks, um, I did just want to say uh, once again, welcome to World CRISPR Day. Um, I hope everyone attending today will find this a useful and educational experience. Um, it's been a real pleasure to gather uh, together the group of very talented scientists that are speaking at this virtual symposium today. Um, and we're deeply thankful to them for making uh, this day special for us too. So our goal has really been here to bring together uh, the genome engineering community uh, to celebrate and share some of the most significant advances and applications uh, of this transformative technology, CRISPR. 2020 has been a really challenging year for many of us for a lot of different ways. Um, and originally we were planning to do an in-person event, um, a World CRISPR Day in person. Uh, last year that we were hoping was going to be in San Diego. So hopefully uh, we'll still be able to, to do that in the future. You know, we've, we've all missed our friends, our, our colleagues, our peers, and, you know, hearing about the latest research in the field and also, of course, being able to network in person. Uh, but this time has uh, brought, to, brought us together in, in new ways. Um, you know, it's, it's really fostered uh, collaborations that we may not have previously considered pre-pandemic. Um, as many of us have shifted, you know, research and, and solutions to help fighting COVID-19. So as you'll hear from some of our speakers today, CRISPR can actually have a significant role to play uh, in fighting COVID-19. Uh, but many groups are, are doing that on top of their main research focus. Um, and we all still have an obligation to continue to develop those cell and gene therapies, to, to breed uh, crops resistant to disease, to understand how cancer uh, or brain disease works um, and how we can just treat it and discover new therapeutics. So, um, you know, and also search for, for new systems for doing genome engineering. So um, all of that research continues. Um, so today we're going to, uh, you know, thank you for joining us. We're going to celebrate um, those research advances. Uh, and in particular, um, you know, uh, the, the role that this Nobel Prize winning CRISPR technology is playing um, in so much scientific research today. 
Before we get started, um, I did just want to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, um, Paul Dabrowski, who is CEO of Synthigo. So um, uh, he's uh, uh, essentially going to be giving us a talk um, that will help you give a get a little background in how Synthigo has played a bit of a role um, in the advancement of the CRISPR technology. Um, you know, uh, and how Synthigo has really worked toward to merge engineering and biology together. So Paul is a technologist. Um, he has a background in computer engineering and also working at SpaceX. So he brings a, a unique perspective uh, around agile development um, it, to the biotechnology space. So um, with that, I would like to introduce Paul and uh, let him take over for his talk. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for World CRISPR Day. It's gonna be quite a treat. Uh, the pandemic and tumultuous environment have created challenges for all of us, adjusting to a new norm of virtual life. However, we're thrilled to have over 11,000 registrants participating from the genome engineering community today. The celebration today uh, is important and timely, as I'll describe in this brief talk, because all of us are part of an unprecedented revolution in the world of life sciences and healthcare. I very much appreciate our inspiring speakers joining us today. We're honored to host this event that brings us together uh, with CRISPR leaders from the community and across the world and demonstrates what's possible uh, when we work together. So uh, today we stand on the shoulder, uh, shoulders of giants. In particular, I could not feel more fortunate and grateful than to have Jennifer Doudna as co-inventor of CRISPR and a leading figure in the field. She's a brilliant researcher, wonderful person and has impeccable judgment and credibility. Her advice and feedback has been invaluable to us at Synthigo. Congratulations, Jennifer. You are most deserving of the Nobel Prize for your achievements. The rapid impact CRISPR has created in the life sciences and beyond in less than a decade is incredible. From the early days as a tool of widely anticipated but speculative reach to becoming a routine technique in thousands of labs and companies, now generating breakthrough insights in a multitude of areas and transforming how new medicines are being created. The journey of CRISPR and my journey at Synthigo are intertwined. Eight and a half years ago, before CRISPR was in our view, my brother Michael and I started the company. We transitioned from the technology sector because the opportunity to make an impact in biotech and healthcare was too significant to pass up. And now I'll give a little bit of my technologist perspective on this. At the time in 2012, Advances in DNA sequencing were drastically improving the ability to extract and read information from the genome. In the computer world, the rates of reading and writing data are described by something called Moore's Law, named after Gordon Moore's 1965 prediction that transistor size and cost would continue to decrease exponentially and computational power would increase exponentially with advances in technology. And this has been the fundamental trend, powering computers, the internet, mobile devices, and all those advances for decades. And what's interesting is there, there are really no other areas in the world where you have parallel trends, except in the biotech and life sciences area. And the parallel trend exists in DNA sequencing the introduction of next generation sequencing surpassed the capabilities of Sanger sequencing and is ushering in a critical revolution that drastically transformed the scale of genomic information capture. And this trend even surpasses Moore's law. My brother and I reasoned as engineers trained in computers that if a huge amount of information was being read from cells and genomes, there'd be a similar tremendous need to write information back into genomes to actually engineer cells. And that resultant exponential growth of genomic data sequencing um, and the applications in human health um, made it really clear that a next generation technology for engineering cells would be needed soon. And so Michael and I were really on a hunt for exactly this type of gene writing capability to help build it into an accessible platform by focusing on creating technology. And we started with the highest quality biopolymer synthesis. Genome engineering methods such as zinc fingers and talons existed at the time, but the field lacked a unifying technology and approach to edit genomes in a scalable and rapid manner. 
uh, across a variety of different species. Fortuitously, Jennifer's seminal paper on CRISPR was published the same year in 2012 as our finding of the company. Michael and I realized that CRISPR, with its ability to precisely edit a variety of genomes, could really be the technology that could transform the ability to edit the genetic code. One line from Jennifer's paper really stood out uh, to us as computer engineers. The possibility of single RNA guided Cas9 is appealing due to its potential utility for programmed DNA cleavage and genome editing. As we started thinking about that, at that critical juncture, we decided to focus on CRISPR, specifically the programmable part of CRISPR. How do you make it more predictable? How do you synthesize the components that really allow for the highest quality uh, gene editing? And that was our humble way into CRISPR that snowballed into what Syndigo is today. Synthetic sgRNA has been a strong foundation that helped us engineer cells, uh, build libraries, and even more recently control dynamics of CRISPR using light, uh, light sensitive molecules. And that enables the biasing of off-target effects and dosing and a whole world. It's, it's a really interesting space. Um, by 2016, when we had first commercialized uh, our products, CRISPR was uh, being used by a multitude of early adopters. It was being applied by experts in a variety of disciplines. Many of our speakers today had already successfully applied it. For example, Matt Porteous was using ribonucleic protein complexes in primary cells towards therapeutic editing. Joe Miano had already started CRISPR engineering mice. Jacob Korn was researching RNA repair pathways post CRISPR editing. Stanley Key was using CRISPR for gene regulation. And it wasn't just the experts who were interested in applying CRISPR at that point in time. Researchers across the globe wanted to use it in their work. However, the learning curve to actually get quality results as with any new tool, new tool were steep. And the unlimited applications of CRISPR are only possible with unlimited access. And Michael and I have always believed that access is critical to widespread adoption to every new technology and moving the science forward. Access is how all researchers and ultimately the general population benefit, benefit most rapidly. How do we enable access? Well, really there's two main pillars. Uh, it's simplifying the technology and decreasing the cost while maintaining the highest quality. Uh, simply it's more for less. And thinking of how to simplify, we encourage the use of synthetic RNAs in ribonucleic protein complexes, because that was the consistent, predictable, highly efficient way that was a bit easier and faster than say plasmids or IVT. And if we go back to the next generation sequencing analogy, I think of ribonucleic proteins for CRISPR as the equivalent of sequencing by synthesis, the key technology in next generation sequencing. It's really what enables exponential growth because of the quality, the stability, and the simplicity of it. And ribonucleic protein editing allows us to further simplify, simplify CRISPR um, by enabling engineered cells so that uh, everyone in the field can skip the learning curve, or you can just get an extra pair of hands in your lab. Uh, we're really interested in making sure everyone can be a genome engineer. The exponential trend in CRISPR is really starting with synthetic sgRNA. Uh, the pricing of uh, ribonucleic Protein libraries now allows for broad access while maintaining the highest editing standards. And there's some great examples of how arrayed libraries, for example, can deconvolute GWAS data into functional causes. And that'll be described by Rafael Asoli's talk today. Additionally, our commitment to accessibility has led several strong partnerships developed over the years. For example, Nevin Kroken will be describing international collaborative work on the COVID-19 interactome, which was recently published in Science. And just as CRISPR is indispensable in several areas of research now, it'll soon be indispensable in healthcare and medicine. CRISPR diagnostics are creating accurate rapid testing paradigm, including uh, detection of COVID-19. Jonathan Gutenberg and Omar Abudadye uh, will be speaking from uh, MIT about their work in diagnostics. Uh, so in addition to diagnostics in the healthcare space, therapeutic applications are fast growing as well. Today, there are 41 registered clinical trials uh, involving CRISPR with the first one back in 2016. Um, one of the heartfelt examples of the potential impact of CRISPR therapeutics stands out to me 
Um, David Sanchez's story is described in the Human Nature film. David's an incredible young man who has sickle cell disease. Though he describes he wouldn't have changed a thing about his childhood because of what he's learned about himself through all the difficulties, he is contributing to the CRISPR therapies that are being created for his condition so that others will benefit. His story is a direct testament to the positive impact CRISPR can have on next generation therapies. I believe that hundreds, if not thousands of medicines will be developed and manufactured using CRISPR the coming years. I'm committed personally and through Synthego to CRISPR-based cell therapies becoming accessible to all patients. We're thinking deeply about how to support the community in this endeavor. As regulatory pathways and understanding for CRISPR-based therapies improve, agile and scalable processes uh, crucial for designing and manufacturing affordable therapies are gonna be needed. And we at Synthego really embody the elegant mix of engineering and biology that enables us to develop scalable platforms. For example, our Halo platforms integrates synthetic chemistry, machine learning, automation, and a variety of hardware engineering to produce a dynamic range of synthetic sgRNA from reagent grade all the way through clinical grade. In future platforms, we will be helping researchers seamlessly transition from the discovery to the clinical trial phase of cell and gene therapies. And as a final point, I wanted to bring up uh, what's called Arum's law, the reverse of Moore's law. Uh, it's literally just the uh, flip of uh, the word. And it's named that way because Arum's law describes the increasing cost of drug development. And it's been a concerning trend for years. Even pharma execs describe the drug discovery and development pipeline is broken or needing rebuilding. And it really has been the case that for several years, the effectiveness and efficiency of discovery and development in pharma has been stalled. However, as CRISPR matures as a technology, it enables improved discovery and development processes in a traditional, in traditional small and large molecule pharmaceutical uh, development, in addition to uh, the, accelerating the enormous potential of cell and gene therapies. And so I find myself dreaming, could CRISPR help reverse Arum's law and in fact make it safe and effective to easily discover, validate and manufacture CRISPR-based medicines? And with these uh, remarks, uh, I'll just note that we're continuing to strive in our mission of supporting researchers uh, in groundbreaking discoveries and clinical endeavors in the future. We're proud that Synthego has been a valuable resource for the scientific community and uh, helping with access to reagents and components. Uh, and we really pride ourselves on helping educate the, the community. And so today is all about education and learning. And I hope you, um, you have fun today and take a moment to really connect with colleagues during these tumultuous times. I appreciate you joining us and hope you all enjoy the experience. And I'll pass back to uh, Kevin to now introduce uh, Jennifer Dabna. Okay, thank you, Paul, um, for, for your talk this morning. Uh, it's very insightful. Um, okay, so um, please allow me to uh, introduce a remarkable woman, a brilliant scientist who just a few weeks ago was awarded, uh, along with Emmanuel Charpentier, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the Discover discovery of the CRISPR genome engineering technology. So we're very pleased to have as our keynote speaker at World CRISPR Day, Professor Jennifer Daubna of the University of California at Berkeley and president and chair of the Innovative Genomics Institute. So uh, Jennifer, please go ahead and uh, take it away. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, Kevin and Paul. What a great introduction. I'd like to just say, first of all, that uh, when I met the folks at Synthago, and I discovered that uh, literal rocket engineers had decided to turn their attention to making RNA, I was uh, astounded because my first lab job when I was a graduate student was actually making RNA. Um, and I had I had zero skill in that day in those days. So it was it was uh, fascinating to see how the uh, the uh, uh, sort of the expertise of engineers could be turned to such a seemingly a uh, simple task, but in fact, they made it, they really turned it into a, a robust technology that is now, as everyone knows, being utilized to make guide RNAs for CRISPR 
And as Paul said, to really look to opportunities to, to, um, to spread this technology widely and make it available to everyone that needs access to it. And I couldn't agree more. I think this is one of the, the real opportunities that we have right now with CRISPR is that it's a technology that allows um, anyone with a, a little bit of skill in molecular biology to manipulate genomes. And that comes with extraordinary opportunity as well as, as, as incredible responsibility. And I've really been involved in both of those aspects of the field over the last few years. And, um, and so I, I, um, I wanted to, what I wanted to say this morning is really just a couple of things. I wanted to point out, first of all, that for all of you that are using CRISPR as a genome editing uh, tool in the laboratory, you may or may not know that this technology actually came from curiosity-driven research that was conducted by a number of scientists, but including myself and Emmanuel Charpentier. And uh, we've been interested for the last uh, about 12 years in understanding how CRISPR works as a bacterial immune system in bacteria to provide a protection against viruses. And it was through studying the molecular mechanisms of this that we understood how a protein called Cas9 works as an RNA-guided DNA cutter, an enzyme that can cut DNA at precise positions defined by the sequence of the guide RNA. And, um, and with that, uh, with that uh, capability, then, it was possible to harness it as a technology for genome editing in cells that are able to repair DNA breaks using non-homologous end joining or homology directed repair. So, you know, so basically um, th this has now become a widely utilized tool for manipulating genomes that is based fundamentally on this bacterial immune system. And the way it works, uh, uh, briefly, is that the protein is able to unwind double-stranded DNA at sequences of 20 base pairs that are marked by the guide RNA. And, uh, and as Paul mentioned, one of the, the advances that was made by, uh, by Emmanuel Charpentier and I and our, uh, our students, Martin Yannick, who was a postdoc with me at the time, and Chris Chylinski in Emmanuel's lab, was to combine what in nature are two separate RNA molecules that guide Cas9 into a single guide format. And that makes, that really turns this into a robust two component tool, one protein and one guide RNA that can be used to, uh, to, to define a sequence for cutting in a genome. And, uh, and by the way, one can do this in a multiplexed format as well, where multiple sequences are manipulated at once. And this, is, this has become, as you all know, a, a, a very um, widespread technology now for manipulating genomes, not just to engineer changes to particular sequences, but also to control transcription and to allow imaging of sites in the genome and, um, and, and utilizing basically this uh, fundamental platform for marking and manipulating specific sequences in a genome. Okay, so the slides are up and um, I can just start on this one. So this is uh, just to remind everyone that the bacterial adaptive immunity that uses RNA molecules to guide protection in cells is, is, um, is, is really what CRISPR is all about. It's a, it's, a, it's a mechanism that evolved over eons in microbes to provide an antiviral mechanism. And, and the thing to appreciate is in, in bacteria, which are rapidly growing cells, when, when DNA experiences a double-stranded break, that triggers rapid destruction of the targeted sequence. So in bacteria, this is a, a very effective way to destroy viral invaders. And importantly, for the cell to remember that invader and keep a record of it in the genome in the form of this uh, sequence array called the CRISPR that stores snippets of sequence that, are, that come from invading viruses. And then if you go to the next slide, so um, this is a, a little video that illustrates how we imagine the system works in a natural setting where you have a biofilm of bacterial cells growing. They are, uh, some of these cells get infected by phage, as in this example here. And if the cell has a CRISPR system, it can acquire a sequence from the phage into this CRISPR array where each viral sequence is stored between a repeat 
sequence in the array. So it's a very distinctive sequence. So that actually was the first uh, tip off scientifically that there was something interesting uh, going on here. And then the cell makes an RNA copy of the array. And uh, it looks like the rest of the video might have gotten cut off. But anyway, the, the RNA copy is what allows the system to work as a programmable system that defines the site of DNA cleavage. So if you click forward, this shows uh, DNA receiving a double-stranded break, for example, with CRISPR. And if these molecules are introduced into eukaryotic cells, where cells have evolved mechanisms of DNA repair, there is a, uh, you know, and this was established in the field of genome engineering long before CRISPR came along, double-stranded breaks could be repaired by pathways shown here that could trigger disruptions in the DNA sequence or integration of a new sequence of DNA during the process of repair. And that's fundamentally how CRISPR works as a genome editing technology is to trigger that kind of repair. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this just shows the work that Martin Yinek and Chris Chylinski did originally in our laboratories where they found that Cas9 is a dual RNA guided enzyme, so it has a separate CRISPR and tracer, uh, separate CRISPR and tracer RNAs that provide the the uh, targeting information for Cas9 in the form of this 20 nucleotide sequence in orange that's on the end of the CRISPR RNA, and with tracer RNA forming a structure that allows assembly of this complex. Um, and then if you go to the next slide. It was research that uh, that Martin and, and Chris were doing that showed that these two RNAs could be combined into a single guide format that allowed a, a simplified system for programming Cas9 in cells. And this was for us that kind of proverbial moment when we realized that a curiosity-driven project to understand bacterial immunity had morphed into something um, really really interesting and different from what we imagined when we started the project, which was a tech, uh, uh, an idea for a technology, basically how this could be utilized to trigger double-stranded breaks in eukaryotes or any cell type and, um, and trigger, uh, trigger DNA repair and thereby introduce site-specific genome edits into cells. So on the next slide, this is a, I'll just show you a, if you go to the next slide, a, a quick uh, video that illustrates how we imagine this working in eukaryotic cells, where of course the DNA is in the nucleus. So by putting a signal onto Cas9 that allows nuclear entry, these RNA guided proteins can then search the, the genome in the form of, uh, which is of course packaged in chromatin to find sequences matching the sequence of the guide RNA. And then when that match occurs, the DNA unwinds there's the formation of an RNA-DNA hybrid inside the Cas9 protein, and then a double-stranded break is created in the DNA. And again, in eukaryotic cells, machinery then arrives to repair the break, and in this example, introduces a small change during the process of DNA repair. And, uh, and so this system was rapidly adopted after the publication of our work in 2012, by laboratories around the world that began using it to manipulate DNA in human uh, cultured human cells, in zebrafish, in plants, and, and, and of course in now many, many other kinds of, of cells and organisms. So if we go to the next slide, um, so you know, what, where, where is this all going? And, and one of the really exciting applications of, of CRISPR technology, but it's only one of many, is the opportunity to use it to cure genetic disease. And just a few short years ago, this would have been, which would have sounded like science fiction, but today we're at a point where we can manipulate DNA in cells in the laboratory to correct disease-causing mutations, such as the one shown here that causes sickle cell disease. This is one of the, uh, the, you know, the longest known genetic diseases. It's caused by a single mutation in the human beta globin gene that leads to uh, a defective form of hemoglobin that's prone to aggregation and leads to the classic sickle shape of red blood cells in affected patients. Today, we're at, we're at a point in the field where clinical trials are already underway for the, using CRISPR to treat this disease. And there's al already the announcement of at least one patient, Victoria Gray, who has had her sickle cell 
disease effectively cured using, using CRISPR, which is very exciting for the field, but also brings with it, uh, I think, you know, extraordinary challenges in terms of access and making sure that this technology is available to all of those around the world that, that need it. And I couldn't agree more with what, what Paul said at the beginning about the next stage of this field now being thinking about how we make sure that people that need access to this technology can get it. And that's certainly something that I and my colleagues at the Innovative Genomics Institute are working hard uh, to do. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we think that one of the keys to all of this is going to be uh, delivery. So we know that the CRISPR technology works well, but the, the challenge is how do we get those molecules into the cells or tissues where they're needed? And uh, for all of you that are uh, you know, starting out your, your scientific career, this is an area where we need real innovation. We need, we need uh, smart people thinking uh, creatively about how to do this and how to do it effectively into specific types of cells. And I, I, I feel very confident that this can be done, but we definitely need to have a focused effort to address it. And this will be one way that we can reduce the cost and make these technologies more widely available uh, worldwide. So if you go to the next slide, uh, safety and efficacy, obviously very important. These are two uh, uh, headlines from you know, the past year uh, from uh, commercial and academic clinical trials that are ongoing. And you know, it'll be very important to follow the, the, these uh, projects to, to ensure that CRISPR is safe and that it's, that it's effective. And then if you go to the next slide, um, we of course want to make sure that CRISPR is, you know, is being used in uh, in ethical ways as well. And you you may know that there was a recent report released from the National Academies that addresses in particular the use of CRISPR technology in human in the human germline and uh, putting in place international guidelines for for uh, responsible use uh, in that in that sort of setting, especially for any future clinical uh, use of that kind of uh, application of CRISPR. And so finally, just in the last minute here, I just wanted to say a little bit about the current pandemic that we're in. And one of the things that's so exciting about CRISPR is that it's a very versatile platform. And so in research that was done by two uh, graduate students originally in the lab, and then has been obviously now uh, you know, developed by, by many others, we understood that some CRISPR proteins have the ability to report on detection of an RNA or DNA sequence by cutting a reporter molecule that has fluorescent dyes appended to it. And so this can be done for RNA detection using the family of enzymes known as Cas13 or for DNA detection using the family of enzymes known as Cas12. And we'll be hearing later in, 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 uh, in the talks today from a team that's working on developing this technology for diagnostics. And of course, there's a number of groups that are doing this both in commercial and academic settings. And I think it's uh, exciting to think about the potential of this to provide a true alternative to PCR or other kind of amplification-based technologies for coronavirus detection in particular uh, to, to meet the needs of this pandemic, but frankly also gives us a, because it is a programmable technology, it gives us a tool that can be easily harnessed to detect other viruses and to prepare for future uh, uh, viral challenges that I, I, I have no doubt, uh, you know, we will, we will have to be uh, dealing with in the future and preparing for. So with that, I just want to, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, yeah, just point out that, you know, the platform, this RNA guided uh, mechanism of recognition is a, is a, is a very versatile way to manipulate DNA and cells and, of course, in vitro, but also importantly in, in cells and, and tissues and, and whole organisms. So I don't doubt that, that we'll see continued advance of the technology, exciting, uh, new, clever uh, uh, ways to use that fundamental mechanism to manipulate genomes. We have to you know, meet these challenges of delivery and then controlling the outcomes of, of genome editing. And of course, doing that in the context of ensuring safety, efficacy, affordability and, and, and widespread access. And that's, that last bullet is really one of the areas where I focus a lot of my attention these days, especially in the context of the Innovative Genomics Institute. And I uh, just wanna conclude with a shout out uh, to many people who have contributed to this work. 
um, a number of folks in my own laboratory, Audrey, Gavin, Jenny, and, and Connor in particular, but of course, many, many others that are shown in this picture here that was taken pre-pandemic, <laughs> pre-social distancing. And, uh, and then collaborators of ours, David Liu at the Broad Institute, Pete Beal up at UC Davis, Keith Young at Harvard MGH. And of course, uh, all of this started with a wonderful collaboration with Emmanuel Charpentier, who's now at the Max Planck in Berlin. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll say thanks. And, and I think we're gonna open it up for questions. Jennifer, thank you again for a great presentation. Um, we did have a question on uh, an, the excellent point you made on affordability and accessibility. Is there any way one can use this technology for affordability as compared to selling gene therapies? Well, I'll just tell, I'll tell you one, one way that I think about it. And that is that, you know, cell, cell therapies require cells to be manipulated. And that's typically being done right now in an ex vivo way. So cells are taken out and, and manipulated, edited, whatever, and then uh, returned to the patient. I imagine a day when we don't have to do that, that we avoid that step, and we actually have a way to manipulate the cells in situ, like in their, in their native setting. So imagine in the case of sickle cell disease, for example, that rather than having to do bone marrow transplantation for each patient, we, could, we had a, a way to deliver CRISPR-Cas9 to the right stem cells in the bone marrow for uh, manipulation in the body and that that could be done effectively and, and uh, safely and, and, and efficiently. That would be absolutely transformative. And I think that's the kind of, of, uh, of advance that we now need in the field to really make this technology available to all of those that, that need it. Great, thank you. And, and we've seen a lot of CRISPR papers coming out uh, specifically around COVID-19. And so I, I, and I know you've been involved in, in a lot of those. So I do have a specific question. Is there a way that CRISPR can be used to modify SARS-CoV-2 to treat COVID-19 directly? I think that'll be challenging. Um, I, I think it, you know, it's certainly a great technology for understanding this virus and, and you know, do, doing things both to host cells and to, um, and to the, directly to the viral genome to understand host virus interactions. But I think using it therapeutically in that regard is gonna be hard, uh, at least in the short term. Again, partly because of this delivery challenge and uh, partly because obviously we're still learning a lot about the biology of this virus and how it interacts with the human immune system, which does uh, seem to be really fundamental to the way that different people respond quite differently to the same virus. Great, th thank you. Um, I, I had one, uh, a couple more. Um, if, if you have a, a few more minutes, uh, how would you see, how would you foresee making direct genome editing as a therapeutic modality accessible for complex diseases? Um, well, I guess if you're, if what you mean by complex diseases are those that have, you know, multi-gene components, which is most things, honestly. Uh, you know, I think there we still need two things, two kind of big, big things. One is we need to know what all those genes are. So, so one of the one of the ways that I see CRISPR having an impact in the near term in biomedicine is really just by uncovering the genetics of disease and um, and, and and importantly, figuring out how genes interact in ways that are difficult to predict, but can be now um, you know dissected through manipulation. That's going to take. Uh, you know, that's going to take real work for sure. And, uh, but, but having a technology that allows manipulation of specific genes and sets of genes is, is, is clearly key for addressing those kinds of questions. And then, um, and then beyond that, suppose you knew a set of genes that needed manipulation to affect a disease outcome. Then the question is back to technology. How do we do that? And how do we do it, you know, effectively and efficiently and safely? And that gets back to figuring out, you know, ways to use the CRISPR technology to manipulate um, large numbers of genes. And it's, I, I have to say, I've seen just some extraordinary data, especially in plants for doing this, where, you know, a, a collection of genes can be manipulated at once in, in plants to have um, desired outcomes. And I think, uh, you know, so I think, I think the, the technology is gonna go there. 
Um, it just, it's just going to take some you know, additional uh, clever work to figure out how to make it really efficient. And, um, and again, um, you know, ensure that we get the, the outcomes that we're after with that kind of multi-gene manipulation. And, and you brought up plants and the human nature film, uh, which you're a part of, and we have the panel today. I talked a lot about agriculture implications and just the overall impact on humanity. So, so my question is, what do you think is the most promising way CRISPR can help humanity as a whole? I think in the near term, it actually will be agriculture and potentially uh, to address challenges of climate change. Uh, you know, here in California, of course, we're seeing the effects of climate change uh, real, real close, right? And and it's it's not a it's not a future uh, possibility anymore. It's 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 here. It's now. And so, um, you know, we're 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 thinking already with a number of our our partners about how to use CRISPR to manipulate microbes in the soil and to, um, um, you know, affect uh, not only sort of the the ability of particular types of plants to deal with the challenges of climate change, but also to manipulate soil microbes so that you can en enhance things like carbon fixation and, um, uh, you know, mitigate some of the other effects of climate change that, that we're experiencing. So I think that potentially will be a near-term impact that will have, you know, potentially again, global, global reach because of the, the importance of it and the ability of this technology to expand in those kinds of settings. Great, and, and there's been a lot of uh, questions coming through the chat on this. Um, many uh, w words of congratulations. And um, I, I think you touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but um, you know, what would you say to the, the future genome engineers and the, uh, the people who are going to be working on CRISPR for the next 50 years? You know, what advice do you have for them? You know, where should they start and, and get going in their career? Well, first, I would say all of you, you are the future, and I'm so excited for, for the opportunities that are, that are at your, your fingertips right now. So it's an extraordinary time to be going into the biological sciences. There's so much to learn. There's so much to be done. Um, and you know, my fervent hope is that CRISPR is, is a wonderful tool for all of you in your, in your research, that it allows you to, to ask and answer questions that may have been impossible to address previously. And also that it leads to, to the next uh, inventions and, 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 and the next discoveries that are really going to solve problems in, in, for, for humanity uh, going forward. Because fundamentally, that's really what we do as scientists. We, we, we pose questions, we, we try to answer them, and, uh, and then we try to develop the tools that are going to allow us to address uh, the next future set of questions. And all of you are the ones that will, will do that wonderful work. Great, thank, thank you, Dr. Doudna, and uh, thank you to Paul and Kevin. Uh, and I would like to thank the audience for riding along with us uh, with, with a few technical issues. We, we really appreciate it. Um, and that, that concludes the opening and keynote, and, and I'd leave it back to you, uh, Dr. Doudna, if you'd like to give any fi final words for the inaugural World CRISPR Day event. Uh, we've got about six hours left, uh, so lot, lots happening today. Wonderful. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here and, and, and uh, it's going to be an exciting day. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Enjoy the day. And thank you again, Dr. Doudna, for inspiring us with your curiosity. And we look forward to what's next for CRISPR. Thank you.